For some reason, the other day, I was at home in the middle of the day. I think I was at home. I may have been in a hotel. But the television is on. I don't, I, I don't know why the television was on in the middle of the day and I was there to see it. But I, all I remember is a television on with Let's Make a Deal playing. I hadn't seen an episode of Let's Make a Deal since I was about eight. But they are remaking the show, and now instead of Monty Hall, it's Wayne Brady. And I already knew that. I knew that the, the show had been recreated in the last few years. I just hadn't seen it until very recently. Uh, but if you've never seen Let's Make a Deal, if you don't know what Let's Make a Deal is, uh, and I still don't understand this part, all the people in the audience wear these ridiculous costumes uh, and come and try to be more... Uh, absurd than the next contestant and then they call somebody's name and they bring them down front and they give them a gift they give them three hundred dollars or they give them some sort of prize and then they present them with a choice and they say okay you've got this thing of value you've got this three hundred dollars or you've got whatever it is now if you'll give me that back I'll give you what's behind this curtain. And sometimes they just give you choices of curtains, but then when you choose a curtain, they say, now I'm going to let you switch if you want to switch. You see what's behind your curtain. Do you want to change? Or maybe you don't see what's behind your curtain. You want to change. But the interesting thing of the show, the reason people are willing to watch the show for decades, apparently, is because the idea of loss. You wouldn't watch a show where a person comes down to the front and they get a guitar or they get a new vacuum cleaner or they get $300 cash. But you'll watch people get a vacuum cleaner or $300 cash and then risk it. And then decide whether or not they're willing to put it at risk in the hopes of something better. And so the, the key to the show is here now, wah, wah, and they lose everything. Oh, we're going to give you two goats, you know. And the truth is, they don't even let the people keep those those terrible things behind the curtains. That's in the rules of the show. If you if you get the zonk, you go home with nothing, or maybe some, you know, gift certificate somewhere. A lot of people have the good life. John chapter 10, verse 10, I asked Brother Jack to read this passage. Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Mike Tomshack has been teaching the epistle of 1 John in the Sunday morning class. He's doing a great job. We were talking about that. And this idea of life that Jesus came to provide is all through the Gospel of John and it's all through the epistles of John. This life that Jesus wants you to have. Verse 9, Jesus says, I am the door. If you enter through me, you will have life. You'll come in and out and enjoy good pasture. You can have it. I'm providing it to you. But a lot of people are putting it at risk. A lot of people are saying, I have what Jesus has made available, but I wonder if I don't need something a little bit different too. If you see here in these passages from John chapter 10 that Brother Jack read, there's two different threats to your life. Two different threats. The idea, the picture that's being painted is a flock of sheep. There is a flock of sheep and sometimes they're in a barn or sometimes they're in a hold, a corral, uh, a, a cave as it might have been in Israel during Jesus' time. But a place to keep them pinned up and safe at night and in the day you might lead them out to pasture or in good weather you lead them out to pasture. In good weather you even sleep with them out in the pasture. But sometimes you have them in some sort of pen or corral. There is a thief who will sneak in and steal sheep. And then there is a wolf that will come and kill sheep. And then there's a hired hand who won't protect the sheep 
from the wolf. Jesus uses both of these images, both of these pictures, in exactly the same statement in which he says, I want you to have abundant life. The thief and the wolf have nothing to do with the sheep that's not yet part of the flock. These sheep are already in the flock. These sheep are already under the protection of the shepherd. But they're still under threat. They're still under a threat. I want us to talk about that for a few minutes this morning. How to lose the good life. You can have it, and then you can lose it. And that's what Jesus is talking about here in John chapter 10. Look at what he says here in, uh, in verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. You think about this, some people steal. Some people will come and walk off with your stuff. The word here for steal, the thief comes only to steal, is the Greek word kleptes. The brute word of our word kleptomania or kleptomaniac. A kleptomaniac is a person with a psychological disorder where they have this compulsion to steal. They'll steal things they don't need. They'll steal things they don't want. They just feel overwhelmed with a desire to take something secretly that they're not entitled to. Well, that's our enemy. Our enemy wants to take, but not from us. Us. He wants to take us from the, from the shepherd, from the master. He's a thief. What does he steal? He steals time. He steals attention. He steals focus. He steals commitment. He steals energy. He uses those things to kill, to kill closeness to kill relationship, to kill belonging, to kill understanding, and ultimately, He destroys. Ultimately, He destroys your relationship with God. He destroys your relationship with your Savior. He destroys your relationship with the kingdom. And He destroys your soul for eternity. You see how this happens, right? It's kind of like putting out a fire. It's kind of like you have a fire in your heart that burns for God. A desire to be with God. A desire to be right with God. A desire to do God's will. A desire to have a positive impact on other people for God. And then, little by little, that fire starts getting put out. All the thief, the enemy has to do is to take away some of the fuel, to take away some of the air supply, some of the oxygen, to put some things on there that don't really fit, that don't really burn, that, that are too wet to burn, and the fire gets smaller and smaller. And so maybe you have some coals, maybe you have some broken down wood that's still hot, but it doesn't have any more fuel and it never flames up. And then those coals burn out and it's still warm. You're dying. Your fire. is That's how it works. That's how Christians go from being committed Christians to being lost again. It, for most people, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens little by little by little. Where your relationship with God is stolen, your relationship with His people is killed, and your soul is destroyed. The thief. 
his, he's a thief, and his desire is to destroy you. John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus said to his opponents, You are of your father, the devil, and you, went, you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan lies to you that it doesn't matter how close you are to the kingdom of God. Satan lies to you and tells you that it doesn't matter if you never contribute to any church work. Satan lies to you and he tells you it doesn't matter if you're about half worldly and about half spiritual. Satan lies to you and tells you that as long as you keep going to church, you're a faithful Christian. Why does he lie to you? Because he wants to kill you. Because he wants to destroy your soul for eternity. If you look here at what he says in verse 12, he goes to the other enemy. He says, He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. The warning here is about who you put your trust in. If you think back to the Old Testament, think back to the days of David and Saul. Saul is the king. Saul and his army are out in the valley of Elah. They're along one ridge line. The Philistines are along another ridge line. Goliath is coming down every day, twice a day, and yelling to the armies of Israel, Send me one man to fight. And all the Israelites are going the other way. David comes. David says, I'll fight him. They take him to Saul. Saul says, You're just a boy. You can't fight him. What does David say? David gives us some insight into a real shepherd. David says, well, when the lion carries off a sheep, I go kill the lion. When the bear carries off a sheep, I go kill the bear. You know what David didn't do when David was a shepherd? He didn't run when the wolf showed up. He didn't run when trouble came. But a lot of people are putting their faith in people who are only concerned about themselves. A lot of people are following people who are only out to get your money, or only out to get your attention, or only out to get your support, and have no real concern about your eternal welfare. You go to the bookstore or type in the search, self-help books, or improve yourself they'll tell you all kinds of things they'll tell you things like all the things that you need to know are inside you they'll tell you do what feels right why do they tell you that because it feels good to you to hear it and if you hear what feels good you'll support them and you'll give them money it's false everything you need is not in your heart Everything that you need does not come from you. It comes from God. The greatest love of all is to love your Father, to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. It doesn't come from you. It comes from Him. The hired hand won't tell you that. The one who's only in it for himself. The, only, the one who's only in it for what he can get out of you. The people who run Facebook. The people who run YouTube. They're not there to help you. They're there to take from you. But you give them more energy and more time and more creativity than you give the God of the universe. Look at what he says here. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. When things get tough, you think they're going to help you? They're not. When you run out of money, you think they're going to help you? They're not. Who are you following? Who has influence 
over your life. Look at verse 14. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. First of all, verse 15 explains verse 14. The explanation in verse 15, when Jesus says, My own know me, and I know my own. Jesus is saying, just like I know the Father, and the Father knows me. So if you think about the relationship between God the Father and God the Son, Jesus on earth, and the closeness of His relationship with God while He's on earth, He says, I have the same relationship with my sheep. Your relationship with Jesus is supposed to be as close as Jesus' relationship with the Father while He was on earth. Does that describe you? Do you feel that close to Christ? Do you feel that close to God? In verse 14, He says, I know my own. Several months ago, maybe longer than that, probably longer than that, one of our mission team meetings, we were talking about uh, one of our relationship builders was, uh, who's the most famous person you've ever met? Um, and I've met a couple of m minor famous people. I once met Pete Rose um, long after he was disgraced. Um, but David Arendale had a list as long as my arm of famous people he's met. I mean, he's, he's gotten autographs or, or some kind of conversation with dozens of people who are super famous. I'm not going to speak for David. I'll, I'll speak for me and Pete Rose. Um, if I called Pete Rose on the phone and I said, Hey, Pete, he wouldn't have any idea who it is. If you showed Pete a picture of my face, he wouldn't remember having ever met me. I, I'm pretty sure, I, I could be wrong about that, but I, I feel confident. <laughs> Jesus says, I know my own. It's not like my relationship with Pete Rose, which is not, non-existent. But I've met him. Jesus says, if you're mine, if you're in my flock, I know your voice. I know what you sound like. I know your accent. I know the kind of words you use. I know the things that get you upset. I know what hurts your feelings. I know what makes you happy. I know what you are and what you are like, says Jesus. I know my own. Remember that second part. Remember the second part of this verse. My own know me. My own know me. Somebody says to you, well, the Bible says that God helps those who help Himself. Do you know that the Bible doesn't say that? Do you know the voice of Scripture? Do you know the voice of God? Do you know what He says? That's what it means, my own know me. It means that you know what He says. It means that you know what His Word says. Four years ago, 2015, when we were doing the Bible Land Passages video, we were over right above the Valley of Ella, probably very close to where the battle between David and Goliath took place. But if you look in the description there, uh, you see that uh, after the Philistines were routed by the Israelites, they fled and they went by a city called Sha'ariam, S-H-A comma or apostrophe A-R-A-I-M. And what Sha'ariam means is city of two gates. And so it was an unusual city because it had two different fortified gates and most cities only had one. Well, on the, one of the ridges above the Valley of Ella, they have found the ruins of a city with two gates. And they propose that this is the location of Sha'ariam. And so we went there 
to make a video, and we were one of the men was doing a video on the life of David. And so we wanted to go there. And when we go there, the, the ruins are in very poor shape, not excavated very much at all. And the other guys are shooting video, and the rest of us are just walking around seeing what's there. Well, while we're there, out on the top of this hill, overlooking this beautiful valley, all of a sudden we hear this bleeding of sheep. And this flock of about 50 sheep just come walking up through the bushes right over the wall of this ruined city. And then about a minute later, this Arab-looking guy wearing long robes is with them. And he's got a staff and he's got two or three dogs. And he's shaking them out of the bushes and showing them where to go. And one stays back over here and he calls to it and then it comes on with the rest of them. You think those sheep would have responded to my voice? If I said, oh, sheep, come over here and get some water. You think they would have listened? No. They don't know my voice. But they know His. You know why they know His? Because they spend every day with Him. You know the only way to know Jesus' voice? To spend time with His Word. It's the only way. Brothers and sisters, that's what next week is about. It's to help people spend more time with the Word of God. A couple of weeks ago when we were out in Idaho, that congregation out there um, has a lectureship. They don't come to church during their lectureship uh, at 7 o'clock three nights in a row. They come in the morning and stay all day and come back that night and then they come the next morning and they stay all day and they come back that night. There were people from two states away who came to hear the Word of God. Do you not feel that desire? Is there something in your life that's more important than the Word of God? You're so busy, you got so much to do. Colossians chapter 2, verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ Himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. This morning in our Bible class, we looked at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 says, By this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. We need to know His commandments if we're going to keep them. And to know them, and to remember them, and to understand them, and to have our hearts knit together by the true knowledge of Jesus Christ, we have to be together, and we have to be studying the Word of God. And it shouldn't be a big question about whether or not the people in this congregation are willing to come and hear the Word of God presented effectively, and meaningfully, and practically. And that's the opportunity that we have next week. Finally, I want you to look at verse 16. Verse 16, Jesus says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They will hear my voice. And they will become one flock with one shepherd. Jesus here is talking primarily about Gentiles. He's talking to Jews, and He's saying there are non-Jews who are going to come into the church. But you see the application to us, right? There are people here who need the Word of God, who are already in the flock, already in the fold. But there are people who are not yet in the fold who will also respond to the Word of God. Let's talk to those people. Let's invite them. Let's ask them to be our guests. Let's welcome them. Let's make it easy for them to not feel alien and strange when they're in a church building. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says, God desires all men to be saved. And then he defines what he means by being saved. And come to a knowledge of the truth. 
You can't separate salvation, commitment to God, from knowledge, from the truth of God. So I hope you'll remember that all Satan has to do to take away the good life that you have available to you is to get you to forget the Savior's voice. It's to steal your attention away from the Savior, to steal your attention away from the Word of God, and to fill your time with everything else, and He'll fill it with anything, to keep you from following the voice of the Good Shepherd. But he's only doing it because he wants to kill and destroy. He is a wolf seeking someone, a lion seeking someone to devour. All of these different images describe Satan to us. If you do not enjoy the salvation that Jesus makes available, it's free for the taking. Jesus has done everything difficult that needs to be done. He's only waiting for you to volunteer, to say, I want what He offers. If you're ready to do that, if you're ready to come to Christ for the first time, the Bible is very simple. You put your faith in Christ. You confess that faith before people. You repent of your sins. You stop living for yourself. You start living for God. And then you're baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. If you need to come to Christ, or if you've wandered away, if you have fallen in some pit and you're ready to be rescued. If you need to return to Christ, whatever your need, please come down front as we stand and sing.